Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. And you are listening to Heavy Board. And we're recording this on September 8th, 2023. Louise Glick's Pulitzer Prize winning collection of poems is the topic of today's episode. And I must admit, I haven't read all of her work. Only a few books and scattered poems here and there. But this book was on the list for many reasons, some just because of its reputation, but I must say that this book was a breath of fresh air when compared to the last two books of poetry I'd read for this podcast. Glick is American literary royalty, and while I'm sure that she would be embarrassed or even dismissive of me saying that, regardless It's true, listeners. Glick is perhaps one of the most influential poets of the late 20th century. Even her more recent works are, what I would call, better than average. But her peak was clearly in the 1990s. And for that decade-long dominance of the art form, she should be respected. In fact, she should be held up as one of the American greats. And of course... As many listeners to this podcast will already know, she is already well-established as such. Her work canonized, her reputation preceding her for the last 25 years at least. Glick is a master from the previous generation, and no one has come close in subsequent generations, quite frankly. The Wild Iris, Glick's sensational and quite masterful Pulitzer Prize-winning collection, is where we dive in today. And aside from the technique that makes all poems good or bad, this little slim volume of poetry uses something extraordinary. I hesitate to say breakthrough, listeners, but it is really a claim to fame for Louise Glick. Her use of the personification of the different flowers in this collection. Many of the poems in this collection personify flowers with human thoughts, emotions, sadness, often heartbreak. In fact, heartbreak seems to be a common theme in this book from the human or even not quite human perspective. But Glick uses these talking flowers to the poem's advantage creating a fantasy garden in which the reader is meant to wander, dwell, be directed. And there is actually some reference to this type of craft technique later on in the book, in poems such as The White Lilies and Retreating Light, two later poems that indicate an ending in this collection, but also tell the reader in a rather artful and inventive way that this is a fantasy but also real, human, but flowers. And these types of poems give us the subtle sexuality that runs through this collection. And before you get mad at me, listeners, I mean a very subtle, not revealed until one of the last poems in the book. But these types of poems also bring in the aspect of writing itself into the collection. So this book works on many different levels. And yes, many will argue with me that writing is always a part of the equation when talking about literature and specifically creating literature. But that's an oversimplification. Implying the method is all the meaning that is needed. It's a cop-out, and Glick is no slouch. The writing is purposefully mentioned in the last several poems of the collection for this particular reason, to let the reader know the fantasy of the garden, marriage, bonding between things growing in a similar place, flowers, give and take, of her own mind even, a fabrication that feels real. 
It seems the speaker of the last couple of poems wants the reader to know it, see it, realize it, and be appreciative in a way. And while that could be somewhat annoying if done in the wrong way or laid on too thick, as we always talk about on this podcast, listeners, balance and proportion are gifts to the craft. And Glick knows this, uses it, balances it out perfectly. And of course, you don't have to take my word for it. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning collection of poems. And as many listeners will insist, no, that isn't the tell-all, end-all of measuring good work. Just listen back to my take on Gary Snyder's Pulitzer Prize winning collection in episode 39, listeners, to hear how little regard a prize like that weighs on my judgment. I judge what's on the page, nothing else. I don't care what anyone else said, what reputation the book has or doesn't have, the legacy and romanticizing of the artist itself. I base all my judgments on the book in front of me. And this one, The Wild Iris, is close to a masterpiece, listeners. And I'm glad it was written at a time when masterpieces were actually recognized as such by the prize committees. Can't say as much now, although Diane Seuss winning one of the big ones last year gave me a little hope that all isn't lost. That some people out there do care about poetry still, and not just because of its proximity to flavor of the week social media causes. Glick's collection actually shuns convention in smart ways, subverting expectations, personifying nature beyond what any of the romantics or modernists even could, and even includes that sort of 90s Gen X self-insertion that has become so popular in literature today. It was still a little new then, listeners, and usually not used as delicately as Glick does in The Wild Iris. These are incredible lyric poems. Yes, this collection is engaging in the lyric tradition while modernizing it. And even though this book was published and praised in 1992, 30 years later, it still sings off the page, a testament to how awful contemporary poetry has gotten. There is no one doing anything like this, listeners. Even Glick herself, in her older years, reaching retirement, is not reaching for the stars in this way any longer. But the first thing that struck me about this collection is that there were no sections. The poems are not clunkily divided up by arbitrary or loosely related subjects. I find this so refreshing. I am one of the few vocal critics who think that repeated tradition of making poetry books into quote-unquote sections is always a mistake. I maintain most poets do this out of reflexiveness and not because the book or collection calls for it. Therefore, I view it as more of a weakness, repeating what they had previously seen. Whereas Glick says the hell with that in The Wild Iris. There are no sections. The 60-odd pages of poetry just move from one verse to the next. No stopping, no arbitrary little symbols to demarcate a change in tone or subject that often isn't much of a change at all in most books, most poetry collections. Most poetry collections clearly have no need to section off little clumps of poems, but it seems everyone does it for tradition's sake and little else. This is a long way of saying, I'm glad Glick doesn't do that and instead goes straight to it, one poem into another. Read them in one sitting as the book is intended to be read. But I was struck by the very first poem, the title poem, the Wild Iris, just how well structured it is, especially compared to my most recent venture into Charles Simic's later work from 2017, where he seems to be running on empty and may just be publishing out of habit. But that same first poem in this collection, literally page one, gave me Emily Dickinson vibes screaming off the page, the very first line even, the attitude, the fierceness without being overbearing, too obvious with it, a subtlety that oozes in between all the lines. 
And I did ask myself at this point, listeners, if I felt this way because contemporary poetry is just so bad, and I had only been reading mediocre books the past few weeks, or because Glick is just that good. But that very first line made me realize I had made the right decision to pick up this book and spend an hour or so on a beautiful desert Sunday morning composing my thoughts hereafter. But what can be said here is that there seems to be at least one great line on every page. The poem's working in tandem to make a reader want to read the entire thing. Something poetry books rarely do. And it does fizzle out a little at the end, coming dangerously close to falling off the rails when the inward direction is taken. And it appears Glick is addressing the reader directly from her own perspective. But that is just the last few poems in the collection. And as I've already stated, Glick manages to steer clear of it tanking the entire thing. It's really a masterful way of avoiding collision and worthy of the endless praise the book has received. It was an absolute pleasure to read this collection of Glick at her peak. There is something to be said for enjambment, but there is a line. And here is where I will let criticism, listeners. Glick in this collection comes dangerously close to overindulgence in the enjambment. More concerned with how it looks or stops the reader on the page than actually what's best for the poem as a whole. And in my reading, Some of the lineation goes completely off the rails, very indulgent, if you ask me, but that can also be ignored. But a poem like Jacob's Ladder really glared at me with the last several lines especially being so broken up and enjammed that it loses the plot, the energy. It breaks it up too much, disrupts the flow, and I can't really see a reason for it. But of course, we will go into more detail about this later on in the episode, listeners. The Wild Iris is pinned throughout with little poems that Glick calls Mateens and Vespers. And this, of course, calls back to the religious-like context. But Glick successfully uses them to broaden that context out in the collection. These little prayers or morning rituals that appear over and over again in the collection, several called Mateens, but no numbers, no other titles. Very Dickinson, really, when one thinks about it. But Glick clearly knows what she's doing with these little insertions, breaking up the book so it isn't just personified flowers on every page, but something more interesting, broadening it outward, extending it toward the human being. And in these little prayers or morning rituals, Glick illustrates in the collection, the book takes on a deeper meaning. In fact, I encourage readers to notice that many of the relationships and more sexual men and women references are contained within these poems, within these matines and vespers. The actual reference to humans gardening, bringing forth life, those things meant to symbolize beyond just the literal growing of flowers in a garden bed, but refer to life, sex, child rearing, relationships, etc. This is a brilliant technique that, I'm sad to say, I see little utilized in contemporary writing. And it manages to anchor the book in a strange way. To let it go off in wild directions, try new and exciting things, make it not total fantasy of talking flowers, but real. And having the human emotions and events side by side with the personification causes the emotive responses to resonate with the reader instead of being overly abstract. Glick shows how to do this like a true master. And as I already said, listeners, she is. Heavy. Bored. Okay, welcome to another episode of Heavy Board. My name is Andrew Wittstadt, and today we're going over Louise Glick's The Wild Iris. Uh, Housekeeping, before we begin. Okay, this is a podcast 
patreon.com slash heavy board you can get full access to this podcast and not just little snippets and partial episodes that i put up on the free feed you get full access and you get a little bit more participation when you sign up for that so go to patreon.com slash heavy board become a member of this podcast get exclusive content exclusive episodes that i'm working on for you guys i have a lot of guests coming up uh while i'm still going to do some of these solo episodes but the guests coming up is going to be great if you can't afford that, don't want to do that, you can still support us in a couple free ways. You can leave us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, you can also check out, subscribe, like, share our YouTube channels. We are at Heavy Board on YouTube and then at Heavy Board Clips for clips if you don't have time to watch the full episodes. And as always, everything we cover will be linked in the description of this podcast. You can go down there and click and find everything we're talking about. And more importantly, uh, if you want to contact us, contact us at heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. I will get it. I will receive it there. Uh, as well as workshop horror stories. Now, the jerk shop has been started. Some of you probably know this. You've seen it. Uh, I'd like to do more of that more regularly if I could as well. I, uh, you know, it always depends on the guest timing. Not everybody, it takes a while to record those. I like to make it easier on the guests, record them at the same time. So we only have to do, you know, one longer, you know, video call session. But, uh, you know, not everybody has that kind of time on their hands. So I am trying to make it a little bit more regular. But <clears throat> one thing that will make it more regular is if you like that and you want to participate, you have a story to share with us, a workshop story, some type of writing story that's horrific and you want to share, send that into heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com where we will read it on the air and commiserate with you and let you know that you are not alone at all. But all right, let's get some coffee and let's get into this book. Regular listeners to this podcast will know, uh, I went on a little bit of a rant in one of the bonus episodes recently where I was talking about how I'm kind of sick of poetry. I'm kind of in the middle of just having a bad time with it. I'm really just disgusted by almost everything I read. I'm disgusted by the lack of curiosity. I'm disgusted by the lack of serious engagement. I'm disgusted by the lack of scholarship. I'm disgusted by the political uh, fodder that is being disguised as um, uh, a scholarship or criticism it is just politics all through the ass i'm sick of it i'm sick of looking at these shitty journals with these shitty poems uh that are decided by supposedly great editors who have zero taste i'm just so disgusted by it i'm disgusted by it so maybe for the next couple weeks here or months as i try to get it's harder to get poetry guests than it is to get fiction guests all right uh people that want to do serious poetry talk with me but uh so if i'm doing older poems over the next couple months or older you know dead writers or, or books that had come out only you know 30 40 years ago like the wild iris um that's why listeners it's because i'm just growing so fucking sick of what i'm seeing that it's just hard for me to even care i really really hard to care like, 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 I don't want to be shitting on everybody, but I mean, Ada Lamone's latest collection was such garbage. Like, all of these people that are being given all these prizes, like, they're just being held up as the grades. Like, I'm just, oh my god, this is so lame. Like, this is so boring. Saying nothing that hasn't been said a thousand times before over the last thousand years, and I just am so bored with it so disgusted at how mediocre it is that i just oh my god it's terrible okay but let's get into this book so wild iris as i said it was originally published in um 1992 uh and i believe that is the same year it won the pulitzer uh Blah, 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 blah. Okay, Harper Collins, blah, 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 published it, and that's the version I have. Uh, the good thing about poetry books is that there usually aren't a whole bunch of editions, right? Uh, yeah, so I do have a, a, a similar thing. And this is a longer book of poetry. Like, there's, there's, there's about 60 poems in this, and there's about 60 pages, like 63 pages in total. So I like that. I think that's good. Okay, uh, there's actually quite a few 
dedications on the front of the page here. A lot of people's names who I have no idea who they are. Um, but, you know, you can dedicate your book to whoever the fuck you want when you're writing a book, right? Um, and the thing I already mentioned in the monologue that I really found intriguing right away when I picked this up was there aren't sections in this collection. There aren't uh, sections that give crutch give a crutch to a lot of mediocre books of poetry and i think that's brilliant i hate sections in poetry books i think they unless they're so obvious and really uh help ground the book and you know separate the different um themes maybe like they have to have a purpose basically is what i'm saying if you're going to put sections in your poetry book and you are going to sit there and then claim that it's necessary well they better fucking be necessary okay I just don't want to hear that. All right, and then we have The Wild Iris. The very first poem on this is the title poem. And the very first line is, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but at the end of my suffering, there was a door. That's the very first line, and I know I had just done Dickinson a few uh, months ago, but I just couldn't get over how Dickinson, that very first line was. At the end of my suffering, there was a door. Just this kind of... Uh, very first line, just being, oh, this is Dickinson inspired. Very much so. Very much so. Uh, and I love it. Hear me out. That which you call death, I remember. Overhead, noises, branches of the pine shifting. Then nothing. The weak sun flickered over the dry surface. And I will say about this here, you guys can hear me read it. The lineation is so good. There are a few parts where it hiccups. That's to be expected, but I just... I don't know if it's because most poetry is so bad at lineation that I am just loving seeing Glick have this kind of lineation in her work. I'm just absolutely loving it. I think it's fantastic. I just wish that more poets would do that. I wish more serious writers would consider that when you break a line on the end of a page here, it better fucking have a reason for it. You better be breaking that line for a reason. If you don't know why you broke it, if it's arbitrary, if it's, no, I was just smashing it into poetry form, then you don't know why you broke the line and it's bad fucking lineation. All right, I don't mean to get upset about this. I just want everybody to know, okay? I'm sick of seeing it. I'm sick of it. And then right after that first title poem, which is fantastic, we have the two Mateens, which I mentioned in the monologue too. And I'm going to talk about the second one on page three here. Um, these are incredible lyric poems. Uh, almost, like I said, a great in the monologue, right? A great line on every page. And after reading the kind of reading this in the aftermath of Charles Simic's like kind of, if you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board to get complete, uncensored uninterrupted full access to this podcast become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board that's right heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you for less than one cup of coffee per month you will receive private access to uncensored full-length episodes jerk shop heavy bonus content subscribers only ama episodes bonus extended interviews and more come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board so like after reading the kind of aftermath of charles simic's career right his later stuff that he's putting out it was a real pleasure for me to read this collection by glick at her peak this is Glick at her peak, okay, ladies and gentlemen, listeners out there. This is Glick at her peak. Uh, some of the best shit she's ever done. But, yeah, I'll read a little bit of this. Unreachable feather, unreachable father. When we were first exiled from heaven, you made a replica, a place in one sense, different from heaven, being designed to teach a lesson, Otherwise, the same, beauty on either side, beauty without alternative, except we didn't know what was the lesson, left alone. We exhausted each other, years of darkness followed. We took turns, working with the garden, the first tears, filling our eyes as earth, misted with petals, some dark red, some flesh colored. We never thought of you, whom we were learning to worship. We merely knew it wasn't human nature to love, only what returns love. 
God. What a great fucking poem. I mean, how can you not say that? We merely knew it wasn't human nature to love, only what returns love. Brilliant. Brilliant. Snowdrops, page six. I had very little note about this other than that it's fucking excellent. <laughs> so well, I'll read it to you here so we can get a few some good poetry while we have it out here listeners again i'm desperate for good poetry so if you know any good poetry that i'm not reading please send it my way uh send me an email heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com etc snowdrops do you know what i was how i lived you know what despair is then winter should have meaning for you i did not expect to survive earth suppressing me i didn't expect to waken again to feel in damp earth my body able to respond again, remembering, after so long how to open again, in the cold light of earliest spring. Afraid, yes, but among you again, crying yes, risk joy, in the raw wind of the new world. Also, I just want to point out this little section here at the end of Clear Morning, probably some of my favorite little couplets here on the pet page eight, so it's a little, it's almost the, basically the end of the poem here. Uh, I cannot go on, restricting myself to images because you think it is your right to dispute my meaning i am prepared now to force clarity upon you brilliant just the attitude again something about the gen x poets here and i would said this when we did nick flynn they just have an attitude that a lot of poets just didn't have for a while there and I think it's brilliant. And right now, the attitude of poets is to be social justice warriors for Democrats and things like that. So we, they really have no love of poetry, no understanding of anything beyond the kind of basic markers of left-wing politics versus right-wing politics. They just have no understanding of anything beyond that. It's a memeified version of poetry, if you will. That's my theory on it anyway. All right. Now I'll go to Jacob's Ladder, which I mentioned in the monologue as being... Uh, one of the weaker poems uh, in the collection. It's the first place where the enjambment is a little indulgent in my reading. Uh, and, and usually that can be ignored, right? Let's be fair. Uh, apart from the kind of last couple lines, line breaks for me. So let, let, me, let me tell you what I mean here. Uh, I'll just read the whole thing and then we can go into it, right? And this kind of goes, you know, the heartbreak is a constant theme in this book and all that. So Jacob's Ladder, the Jacob's Ladder is what it's called. Trapped in the earth, wouldn't you want, wouldn't you too want to go to heaven? I live in a lady's garden. Forgive me, lady. Longing has taken my grace. I am not what you wanted, but as men and women seem to desire each other, I too desire knowledge of paradise. And now your grief a naked stem, reaching the porch window, and at the end, what? A small blue flower, a small blue flower, like a star, never, to leave the world. Is this not what your not what your tears mean? And for me, it's those last couple of that never on the third to last line there. A small blue flower, like a star, period, never break to leave the world. Exclamation. So she's using exclamations on this. Is this break not what your tears mean? And that's just the first thing I noticed about it. I was like, eh, you know, a little bland, a little, you know, lineation, whatever. You could ignore it. But like I said, I can't. And this is where I did start to pick up on the theme of heartbreak, where I was like, yeah, it's, it's kind of a constant theme in this book is, is heartbreak, grief, uh, uh, tears, um, these kind of lyrics on, on, on meditation, matins, prayers, vesper, desperation. Uh, and it's not a desperation to be loved or, or to... It's a very unique type of desperation. It's a desperation to live. And I mean that in the broadest possible sense, to experience, right? To, you know, meditate, whatever it is kind of thing. Uh, but of course, if you disagree with me, write that in. I'd like to hear people's takes on this and I like to go into it. Uh, you know, I'm interested. If you have a take that differs from mine, you want to tell me why I'm wrong or give me an argument, uh, you know, friendly. I'm not saying it has to be hostile. But if you want to do that, please do, because I like that i'm trying to create this space for readers who are serious about this not just people who want to be part of a scene not just people who want to pretend to be writers i want serious 
uh, considered uh, critiques, feedback, all of that. Like I want people to have a place where they can seriously do this and not have to be reliant on the kind of fake niceties of academia and things like that. So please, if you have something to say, write it in heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. And like I said, I've been thinking about doing an, a bonus segment for subscribers where I go into some of those. Uh, maybe once a month or something, I go into the arguments that I've been sent, um, try to keep them together and kind of read the emails. And, and um, yeah, it should be fun. It should be fun if you guys are into that. All right, Field Flowers on page 28. I like it, but the line breaks. Again, it's kind of these one of these lyric-type poems. It's a little little rough on the lines for some of these. What are you saying? That you want eternal life? Are your thoughts really as compelling as all that? Certainly. You don't look at us, don't listen to us, on your skin, stain of sun, dust of yellow buttercups. I'm talking to you, you staring through, bars of high grass shaking, your little rattle. Oh, the soul, the soul, is it enough only to look inward? Contempt, for humanity is one thing, but why disdain the expansive field, your gaze rising? Okay, that is the worst line break. Disdain the expansive break field. Field, comma. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Your gaze rising over the clear heads of the wild buttercups into what? Your poor idea of heaven? Absence of change? Better than earth? How would you know who are neither here nor there standing in our midst? Again, just the line breaks. You could hear me read it. I won't say anymore. Okay. And uh, this is also where I noticed right around like how the Mateen's kind of, the Mateen's poems and the Vesper poems really start to shine through. And like I said in the monologue, really giving us that kind of very powerful uh, 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 moments where we're not just talking about the flowers as most of the poems are titled according to, you know, flower species and things like that. The Mateen's are a little separate. And I think it is brilliantly used in this, the way they space out the work. And, and here's what I wrote on it. I'll, I'll butcher this, but let me tell you. And I did think, originally I went with the original French, right? Like the kind of basic French, Matins, Mornings, right? Or whatever. But then, you know, I did learn a little bit about how it's morning songs. Like kind of like, you know, the, the, the morning songbirds kind of thing, but also the first kind of hour of prayer in the Christian faith. And it shows how kind of effective these are in the collection, these little mateens, anchoring the book to something other than just the flowers and heartbreak and this other stuff. It's broadening it out in a way. Uh, so, you know, mateens are uh, really fucking good. And they become vespers later in the collection, you know. Uh, and, and they all work in this awesome way. So, The Doorway. Page 33. Uh, this is the one that I, I kind of isolated out as it doesn't quite seem to fit in this collection to me. Uh, the title alone kind of makes it stand out. And it is good. Like, it's a good poem. Like, I don't want to say it's a bad poem. Uh, there's really nothing wrong with this in terms of craft, poet, poetry-wise. I just think it just doesn't quite make sense in the collection. So I'll read a little bit here. Uh, I wanted to say, as I was, still as the world is never still, not in midsummer, but the moment before. The first flower forms, the moment. Nothing is as yet past. Not midsummer, the intoxicant, but late spring, the grass not yet. High at the edge of the garden, the early tulips beginning to open. Like a child hovering in a doorway, watching the others, the ones who go first. A tense cluster of limbs, alert to... The failures of others, the public falterings, with a child's fierce confidence of imminent power, preparing to defeat these weaknesses, to succumb to nothing, the time directly, prior to flowering, the epoch of mastery, before the appearance of the gift, before possession. You can tell me what you think, if you think that fits or not. I think it doesn't really fit, quite frankly. Sorry, let me get a toot on this vape here. I'm uh, jonesing for some nicotine. Almost out of fucking jewel pods, and that's pissing me off here. Uh, I'm going to get to my favorite poem in this whole collection here, which I did tweet about uh, a while ago when I was reading this collection and taking notes to the first first read. Uh, so if you follow me on social media, at Andrew Whitstead on Twitter there, you'll see me tweet out things I'm reading. And then I, I did do that roundup, and I had one. Shout out to Eric. He did... Um, 
say he enjoyed the bonus episode of the reading roundup so maybe i'll do that again next month at the end of september here and uh you know guys you know guys, you know let me know let me know if you like that or not if you think it's you know let me know what you've read too what you think of these books etc but daisies is my favorite poem in this whole collection page 39 and um i've always loved the kind of flowers aspect to this collection but the overall tone in this one exceeds all the other poems the kind of the playfulness of the flower speaking really shines through uh, the attitude given to the daisy and what it represents the comparison to the modern machines and, and natural machines like flowers just brilliant absolutely brilliant let me read it to you here a few bit i'll try not to butcher it for you guys hopefully i've had enough coffee that i'm uh my eyes aren't gonna be uh playing tricks on me when i try to read daisies go ahead say what you're thinking the garden is not the real world machines are the real world say frankly what any fool could read in your face it makes sense to avoid us to resist nostalgia it is not modern enough the sound the wind makes stirring a meadow of daisies the mind cannot shine following it and the mind wants to shine plainly as machines shine and not grow deep as for example roots it is very touching all the same to see you cautiously approaching the meadow's border in early spring when no one could possibly be watching you the longer you stand at the edge the more nervous you seem no one wants to hear impressions of the natural world you will be laughed at again scorn will be piled on you as for what you're actually hearing this morning think twice before you tell anyone what was said in this field and by whom incredible poem few little line break things that i would get nitpicky about right like she just i think she she makes you hesitate a little too much as you're reading through this with some of these hang-ups here and i it, it was a thing in the 90s from what i can tell listeners you know i was a child i wasn't reading these books as they came out but i was as i could go back and read from this kind of era now the kind of 80s and 90s this was so common and i really can't stand it but you know whatever this poem is my favorite in the whole collection i tweeted this out i put this on instagram i you know i'll probably do it again when i post this episode but yeah let me know what you think what your favorite was i i find very little to complain about besides lineation in this all right what else do i have here moving right along harvest page 46 uh so this is one where i think the line breaks look uh great uh, it's a little vague but it actually works to broaden the poem in a way that i think you know, proves that Glick is a master harvest on page 46 here. It grieves me to think of you in the past. Look at you, blindly clinging to earth. As though it were the vineyards of heaven, while the fields go up in flames around you. Ah, little ones, how unsubtle you are. It is at once the gift and the torment. If what you fear in death is punishment beyond this, you need not fear death. How many times must I destroy my own creation to teach you this is your punishment? With one gesture, I established you in time and in paradise. And this is where I talked about in the monologue how these kind of, they go into writing. It kind of goes into this uh, being a writer, crafting, creating, all this kind of thing. Like it starts to be um, more grounded. It starts to take it further than just flowers in the garden being personified. It, it, it really uh just makes this book sing as you get towards the end of it and like i said in the monologue it kind of it burns out a little bit but as you just keep going it is just man louise glick is good you know like this is her peak she was so on fire during this period of her life and writing great stuff and i'm glad she has uh that we can have it forever now before uh the woke scolds come for it i guess but yeah 
I just, I mean, for this, I have very little criticism beyond some of my little nitpicky things, you know, so this is just a great book. If you don't own it, if you haven't read it or don't own it yet, buy it. We talked a little bit about Luis Glick on the Cassandra episode with Richard Sykin, uh, Richard Sykin's crush with our, my guest Cassandra. Go listen to that if you haven't yet. It's a good episode, a lot of fun. But the last one I had marked here for myself that I thought was worth, um, well, that's not true, the last one. I have last two, I have Retreating Light and The White Lilies. So the retreating light, obviously talking about sunlight, but this is going broader too. Like I said, the Matins and everything, the book kind of builds into broader relationships, marriage, divorce, children, all this kind of things, you know, of life. Like I said, the broader kind of desperation to live is what I would say the main point would be. And very broad, live being very broad. But retreating light, you were like... You were like very young children, always waiting for a story. And I'd, be, and I'd been through it all too many times. I was tired of telling stories. So I gave you the pencil and paper. I gave you pens made of reeds. I had gathered myself, afternoons in the dense meadows. I told you, write your own story. After all those years of listening, I thought you'd know what a story was. All you could do was weep. You wanted everything told to you and nothing thought through yourselves. Then I realized you couldn't think, with any real boldness or passion. You hadn't had your own lives yet, your own tragedies. So I gave you lives. I gave you tragedies. Because apparently tools alone weren't enough. You will never know how deeply it pleases me to see you sitting there, like independent beings, to see you dreaming by the open window, holding the pencils I gave you, until the summer morning disappears into writing. Creation has brought you great excitement, as I knew it would, and it does in the beginning. And I am free to do as I please now, to attend to other things in confidence. You have no need of me anymore. It is almost like a direct address to the reader, right? The you bringing the reader into the poem like that. Uh, I just thought it was great, absolutely great. And again, a little broad, but I think it works for the overall themes and how the book was going up until that point. And this is like kind of the last couple poems, you know? Uh, yeah. And this is where like the White Lilies, kind of one of the last poems in the collection, literally the last poem in the collection, the White Lilies. Uh, this is where I started to get that kind of very, very subtle kind of sexuality to these poems. It started to really come and hit me towards the end here. Oh, these are also kind of about sex in a small way. You know, love making, pollination, um, you know, buried to be born type thing, like this kind of, you know, sexual uh, tension, violence to some of it. Uh, but I'll read this one and we'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. The White Lilies. As a man and woman make a garden between them, like a bed of stars, here they linger in the summer evening, and the evening turns cold with their terror it could all end it is capable of devastation all all can be lost through scented air the narrow columns uselessly rising beyond a churning sea of poppies hush beloved it doesn't matter to me how many summers i live to return this one summer we have entered eternity i felt your two hands Bury me to release its splendor. So it's kind of like gardening, but also like the man and woman, right? This kind of like really just kind of a broader sexual thing to it that I found very intriguing and, and very smartly done. It isn't this kind of, you know, um, very, it's very subtle. I've already said that, but it's very subtle. It isn't this kind of, you know, like broad, like I've, you know, sex, like all over the page. It is subtle it is refined it is it is it is it is difficult and 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 also very clear it, it it's it's blended into these the, the the flower personification the growing the kind of tragedy and heartbreak that is filled throughout this whole book and it subtly blends the sexual elements of all of that that's tied up in all of that you know relationships and things so well and I just, it started to dawn on me as I got towards the end of the book. And that's when it really started to hit me as like, oh, this is masterful. This is a masterpiece by Glick here, this entire book. 
Again, her best book, her most awarded book, and it deserves it, okay? It deserves it. Yeah. That's all I got. Took me a while to get there, I guess, but... That was, uh... That's Luis Glick. Uh, again, this is a podcast, listeners. Uh, you can receive full access to this podcast if you support us on patreon.com slash heavyboard for, less than fi- for just $5 a month. You will receive full access to every episode, nothing censored, nothing behind the paywall. You'll get it. Uh, if you can't afford that, don't want to, there are other ways to support us. You can leave a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. That helps us out, helps us grow. It's a free way to support us. You can also check out our YouTube channels. At Heavy Board on YouTube is the main channel. At Heavy Board Clips on YouTube is the Clips channel. Give those a like. Give those a subscribe. Uh, you know, Send them to your friends and family. That's a good way to support us. It's free. It really helps us out. So that's uh we appreciate it uh and if you have a workshop story to stare, share if you have a workshop story to stare to, if you have a workshop story to share with us please send that into heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com we will read it on the air anonymously and have a good time with that uh and that's it that's housekeeping everything that we covered be linked in the description below and this has been another episode of heavy board see you I am heavy, heavy, heavy board. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.